we get the account of what happened to Jesus on the night of the crucifixion. We get that account from the four Gospels. We're a Bible church. We believe what the Bible tells us, that this, this happened. This is true. This is the true account of what took place to Jesus, the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, as Jesus is in the garden, Jesus says, going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, this is Jesus in the garden, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The crucifixion that we just read about and we sang about and we heard about is what took place between the if and the yet. If there's any other way. If you can take this cup from me. If we've all been there. We all have an if in our life. If God, please. And then the yet. But not my will. And our example, our greatest example to walk the face of the earth is Jesus who says and lives and dies between the if and the yet. If there's any way, I'd rather go that way. Yet it is not about me. It is your will be done. Jesus, the crucifixion story is all about living in between the if and the yet. I want to just spend a few moments looking at the question that Jesus asked. Maybe, maybe the greatest question Jesus has ever asked. Maybe the greatest question that's ever been asked in the history of the world. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, why would you forget about me? God, what, where are you, God? Why are you abandoning me? I don't, I don't understand this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want to just focus on a few, just a few words this evening. The text tells us that he cried out. I want to focus on the word cry. I want to focus on the word my. And I want to focus on the word why. Because I think... These are questions we all have at some point in our life. We definitely can relate to the cry. We've all cried. From the first moment we came into the world, we've been crying. And we haven't stopped crying, have we? We grieve every day. We shed tears over broken things all the time, broken relationships and lost relationship and lost love and Unmet expectations and unmet dreams. We cry, Jesus cries. Jesus cries. Three things this evening. Number one, when he cries this cry, there's total blackout. And this isn't just a storm rolling in. It goes completely dark. There's a power outage. And the power outage is the sun, moon, and the stars go out for three hours. This is significant. This didn't happen to a normal criminal on a cross. This was unique. This has never been seen before. It never has been experienced since then. It goes completely dark in the middle of the day from noon to three in the afternoon for three hours. He cries this cry and it goes completely dark. When God cries, there's darkness. When God cries... The the Greek tells us the word cry is actually shriek. If you're making this story up, you wouldn't make your God crying at the time of his death. In fact, every other religion tells their story of how their hero dies with great courage and saying great heroic things. Jesus shrieks, he cries. There's total blackout. The weekend that Jesus died, it was actually a Jewish holiday. 
It was called the Passover. And why is it called the Passover? Because hundreds of years before, Moses is asking Pharaoh to let my people go. Some of you may be familiar with the story. Moses, let my people go. And he didn't. He says, Moses, let my people go. And he didn't. He says, let and so there's the ten plagues that show up. Plague after plague after plague after plague. And the last plague is the death angel's going to show up. And when does the death angel show up? The death angel shows up, not in the middle of the day, but in the darkness of the night. Darkness of the night. The death angel shows up. And the de death angel passes over the God-fearing Jews who place their faith in what God has said to place the blood over the doorposts. It's the pass over. It's not an accident that Jesus died on the weekend of Passover. What's happening? Total blackout. Darkness reigns. Jesus prophesied this. The hour is coming, the hour of total darkness. It's the last word to Pharaoh before the angel came. Darkness precedes the sacrifice of Christ. The first one, total blackout. The second thing that's happening is there's divine vandalism. God desecrates the temple. Who desecrates the temple? Jesus does. When he dies on the cross. You see, what, what would happen ever since sin entered the world and eventually the people leave Egypt and God wants to create a, a special nation. He wants to create my people and he wants to be their God and they're going to be his people and he creates, and he needs people and he needs a law and he needs land. And he has the people and now he's going to give them the law and part of the law is there's going to be a priest to me, all these priests and the processes and systems established to take care of our sin. And what does that look like? A priest would, would, before he could atone for the sin of the nation, before he could atone for the sin of the people, he had to atone for his own personal sin. So there would be a priest that would go to the temple, and the priest would always be carrying something. What would the priest be carrying? Animals birds and goats and sheep and lambs and they'd be carrying not just for themselves but then they'd, they'd carry animals for the nation and what's happening at this, this moment up before Jesus up until Jesus there are certain times that you can come to God and there's certain locations you can come to God certain days of the week that you would come to that the priest would come to God and there was this great divide, a symbolic divide that, that would hang before the people. It was this really thick curtain, big, thick curtain. And what's happening at the moment that darkness fills the earth and the moment that the God, God cries, what's happening is the curtain is ripped in two. It's tore from top to bottom. God cries, and the, the curtain is torn, too. And in that moment, what is happening? We're all being told, you don't need a special day. You don't need a special location. You don't need a special time. And you don't even need another person. You now can come before God boldly before him anytime in any need. Confessing your sin directly to him. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You don't need any other person for you to personally stand before God in the throne room of God. The curtain's, the curtain's been ripped, my friends. You don't have to wait for a certain day of the week. You don't have to wait for a certain holiday. You don't have to wait for a certain person to show up. You don't have to wait for the doors to be open. You can stand before your God any minute, any moment, why? Because Jesus tore the curtain in two. And now there's direct access for every one of us to stand before our holy creator God, the God of the universe. Why did Jesus die? So you and I can have direct access to God tonight. You and God face to face. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? 
He cries out. There's divine vandalism. This gigantic mechanism barred the way between man and God. For hundreds of years, the question was, how am I going to get to God? And Jesus, when he rips that curtain, he's saying, the old is abolished. You no longer have to go to a certain building, person, location, or time. He's, Jesus says, come to me. Why isn't this priest on this Passover, as he goes to make a sacrifice, why isn't he carrying anything? Because he is the sacrifice. This priest isn't carrying anything to atone for his sin and the sins for other people. He is the sacrifice. And the only thing he carries is a cross. This priest is the sacrifice. He's not making a sacrifice. This priest is the sacrifice. He is the sin bearer. And as he does that, it allows us to enter into the presence of a sinless God. He doesn't carry anything. How could a priest every, every day go before God without a sacrifice? This priest goes into the presence of God carrying nothing. Because this priest is the victim. There is nothing he could or should carry because he himself was a sacrifice. The light of the sun turns away as, he, as the Father turns his face away. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I might be forgiven. If you have children and they ask you what Good Friday is about, tell them Jesus was forsaken so that you might be forgiven. Now, it's not just removing the price and punishment of sin. Jesus is also removing the effects of sin. The effects of sin. He's, he's taking care of our greatest need, our spiritual condition. He deals with that. It's our greatest need. Our greatest need isn't physical, it's spiritual. And Jesus took care of that. And so every person who calls on the name of Jesus does not need to be afraid of death. Death has no victory over you, my friends. I had an opportunity to visit the hospital. It's, a, it's something I do on Good Friday. It's just something years ago. I visited the hospital, somebody who's sick and, and struggling, and it's sermon prep for me. As I walk through the halls, and every time you drive by a hospital, it's the effects of sin in this world. And we all feel it one way or another. All our bodies feel it. And death one day will all experience as a follower of Jesus. I'll experience the shadow of death. I will not experience the full weight of death. Why? Because Jesus defeated death on the cross. And that is, that is good news. John Stott says, For the essence of sin is a man substituting himself for God. While the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. What's happening in this, in this question, this great question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I believe Jesus is singing this. I, I think there's a cry, I think there's a yell, there's a, maybe a tune, maybe there's a note because it's, He's reciting, he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, which was written by David hundreds of years before. It's prophecy. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, as David pens that about his own son, he writes, David writes, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's prophesying to Jesus on the cross. He's describing an execution in all of Psalm 22. You can read that. On Silent Saturday, tomorrow, you need scripture text to read. Wake up, read Psalm 22. It's David writing about what Jesus is going to say on the cross hundreds of years later. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is not going out in a whimper. I've been around the bedside of a number of people who take their last breath. And they're usually gasping for air, and there's a whimper, and there's, they're not yelling. Despite Hollywood's picture of Braveheart, Mel Gibson at the last scene where he cries out and yells, freedom, people don't die yelling unless you're the son of God. He has his full faculties in mind at the very last second before he takes his last breath. He says later, into my hands I commit my spirit. That 
we're told he shouts as well. He's, he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's fully present. He's fully aware. In the darkness, he cries out in a loud voice. He cries. Now I ask the question, why do we have an answer to this question? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the, I could give you two answers. The, the first answer is the theological answer, and that is for the glory of God. Nothing happens that isn't for the glory of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten for the glory of God? But Jesus was giving glory to God while he was in heaven. He could have continued to give glory to God. Wherever Jesus is, he can give glory to his Father. The, the, the Trinity is, is one and yet three. It's three and yet one. It's a profound mystery. What's happening in this moment is there is a separation. The Father turns his back on his Son while he is on the cross. And we've all experienced loss to some extent. We've all experienced the loss of love to some extent. Now, if it's an acquaintance, you're like, okay. You, you get up the next day and you move on. It's not that big of a deal. If it's a, if it's a friend, that hurts. A friend betrays you and denies you, that, that hurts. But if you'll, you'll eventually get over it. If it's a family member, if it's a parent, or if it's a son or daughter, that takes, there's wounds there. That, that's really hard. That drives you to your knees. It causes us to shed tears when that happens. Some of us have experienced that as a spouse. Some of us may know a really amazing, powerful marriage relationship. And you look at him, you're like, wow, that's so incredible. They've been married 65 years, 70 years. That is a drop of dew compared to the ocean of the experience that God the Father and Jesus had together in perfect relationship for eternity. They had been together for eternity as one. And in this moment, the last of Jesus' concerns was the physical, what was happening to his physical body, which was great and significant. There's the spiritual separation. He was experiencing hell times a billion, worse than hell for one person. He was experiencing hell times a billion, eternal separation from God in this moment when he takes his, he takes his last breath. It's the, it's the grand finale he cries, and he asks the question, why? He cries out, and he says, my God, my God, what's that? What's happening in this? In Jeremiah, when, when God creates the nation of Israel, he says, he, he makes a covenant promise to all the people, he says, because he loves us, he says, you will be my people, and I will be your God. There is something really profound when we can say, my God. There's a, there's a relationship there. And what is, what is Jesus saying? My God. It's what God told to his people. Now, what's, what's happening here is, is really interesting because Jesus is being perfectly obedient to his Father. Now, throughout Scripture, when you're perfectly obedient to the Father, you live. You get life. Uh, let me bring you back early on in, in Genesis. When sin entered the world, there was a man named Adam. And God told Adam, hey, if you obey me, you will live. And we all know how that ended. If, if you don't obey me, you'll die. Well, what does God say to Jesus? If you obey me, if you follow me in perfect obedience son, I will crush you. I will crush you. Adam, you obey, you live. He didn't obey and he died. Jesus, you obey me, you obey me, and I will crush you. And what does Jesus do? He perfectly obeys his father. Perfect obedience. Why? Okay, for the glory of God, good answer, true. Why else? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Listen, friends, here's the answer. You. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the father says, because of Kyle. You put your name in there. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forgotten about me? And God says, because I want a relationship with you. He forsakes his son, turns his back on his son. Now, there's two substitutes happening here. One is, our sin is placed on Jesus on the cross. That's not the only substitution that's happening. There's a great exchange happening. Then the righteousness of God is placed on you. And so now, the Father treats you like he treats Jesus. Are you kidding me? This is mind-boggling. I don't deserve that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural And after that, the spiritual, the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. Jesus is called the second Adam. It's called a a type. Jesus says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay down my life and to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Because Jesus was man, he could experience death. And because he was God, he could destroy it. Death doesn't have the final say here tonight. Jesus has the final say. Everyone else in the history of the world, obey and I will be with you. Jesus, obey God and you will be abandoned. Obey God and you will be cursed. My God, my God, why did you forsake me for you? It's the answer to the question. And I don't know if you've ever placed your faith, I don't know if you've ever recognized the cross was for you. The reason Jesus goes to the cross is because God loves you. And you are not your, your sin, my friends. You don't need to live in guilt and shame and in the shadows of your past. Because Jesus paid that price. And not just your sin from yesterday or your sin from today, your sin for tomorrow as well. None of us need to go to the cross. Jesus already paid the price for our sin. We're going to have a moment of communion. We're told to remember the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. The Bible tells us often, frequently. And so this is an opportunity for you to reflect. I'm just going to encourage you to have a time with Talk to Jesus. Talk to him. You don't, you don't need to go through anybody. You can talk to Jesus directly. You have direct access to the throne room of the heaven. What an incredible privilege that is. So we're going to take a few moments and you can talk to Jesus. I'm going to invite the worship team up. I'm going to invite the ushers down. I'm going to pray. And so, Father, as we come to the table this evening... I pray that you would speak to us, that you would let us know how, what a great sacrifice it was, and that you would let us know how much you love us. I pray as we come to the table, we would confess our sins directly to you. It would be specific. We would, God, you already know what we've done, but you ask us that we would confess to you. And so I, I pray that in the next few moments, we would have the freedom to be honest with you. And we reflect on the great sacrifice of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.